Hey guys, this is CFF All Access. This is the College Fo Fantasy Football Podcast of Fantasy Points. My name is Josh Avalli. I'll be hosting tonight. I'm at CFF Guys on Twitter. I'm joined by Zach Hall at CFF Champs and Eric Froton of NBC Sports, the uh, the props god over here. We got him on this show, and so we're super excited to be here. We are we are doing a daring feat tonight. We are doing a live stream. 20 minutes before the start of the national championship game for the men's. Luckily, it's not as big as the women's, so we should be all right. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, here's the other thing about basketball. You only got to watch the second half of a basketball game anyways. Nothing really happens in the first half. So uh, we will keep you. We will be your entertainment for the first half. Halftime will hit, and then you can go back and watch the rest of, that, rest of that game. So excited to be with you guys tonight. We are going to get into our top 10 CFF wide receivers. But before we do that, we have a special segment tonight. We want to talk to you guys about tight end risers and fallers. And so Jared Palmgram of Chasing the Natty and Campus to Canton, he put out a bunch of tweets this week talking about ADP risers and fallers, and he had one about tight ends. And so I'm going to share a graphic with you. And then Froton, I mean, he had some things that he he loves talking about tight ends. If you get him on tight ends, he will rant. So, uh, so we're going to give the floor to Froton and let him take things over from here. Yeah, well, I mean, if you notice anything about this ADP risers graphic, uh, I don't know if it's up there yet or, or what our technical capabilities are at the moment. But um, the the five names that we got, Bryson Nesbitt, Aronde Gadsden, Tyler Warren, Penn State, Dalvin Smith, Western Kentucky, and Holden Willis of Middle Tennessee. Now, there's something that three of these five tight ends have in common. You've got three Tito's. Now, that's, as everyone knows, if you're watching this and you're a college fantasy football enthusiast, that is a tight end in title only. And you have Gadsden, Dalvin Smith, and Holden Willis. At least Holden Willis had at least the uh, you know, the respect of giving us 6% of his snaps in line, a mere 24 routes run of his 300 and 99 pass reps that he lined up for. So uh, that is the best of that group in terms of how often they actually lined up at the tight end position, yet they're being considered tight ends. And this is an artificial bump. They shouldn't be tight ends. That's why they're going up in the ADPs because everybody went and took a look and said, all right, whoa, I can cheat the system with Holden Willis and with Dalvin Smith and with Aronde Gadsden, they should be outlawed. None of the three are actual tight ends. None of them hit even the 10% snap threshold that I think should be utilized, which is the baseball model, which is at least if you just hit 10% of your snaps from an inline position, and we have plenty of technology that's easy to do nowadays, then you should be considered a tight end. So I'm going to eliminate all of them. Uh, Tyler Warren's going up. Because it's the tight end legacy at Penn State. We saw it with Theo Johnson last year where he, oh my gosh, he tested like an absolute freak. And they expect Warren to do the same. Um, had good per route numbers. The idea is hopefully he gets a larger target share, you know, where he isn't going to be in a 50-50 situation with Johnson. You do have Andrew Rapelia there as well. But uh, Tyler Warren's looking pretty attractive. And I can I can understand why he's getting a bump. Yeah, I love that, man. I, I love your take. We got a lot of takes here in the comments. Uh, Shane said no Tito's over here. And uh, <laughs> Steve. My man. Steve, I mean, if we're talking about the vodka, you know, I'm from Austin, I'm a little I'm a little biased there. But, uh, but you know, <laughs> Clint, whatever, whatever. But, yeah, we got. Uh, calling me out for not having a Tito song. Yet. Yes. You know what? That's a great point, Clint. You have to give it up to him. If anything, I guarantee you, by the Fantasy Football Expo for karaoke, I will have a Tito song ready. I don't care if I have to go Jackson 5, go Tito Jackson, if, if I have to stretch it. Uh, yeah. Whatever has to be done to get a Tito song uh, on the stage, on the big stage at the Expo. Great call. There we go. It's been it's been spoken into existence. We will have a Tito song by the Expo. Be I there, be square. The there we go. There we go. Uh, let's see what else we got here in the comments. Tight end you by Dan Brown. Now, do you have any comments on the on the fallers there that you wanted to talk about as well? Or was it just you just want to talk about, about Tito's? Oh, sure. I'll talk about the fallers. Why is Mitchell Evans a faller? 
What's going on? Did, oh, I'm sorry. All of a sudden, Notre Dame, Riley Leonard comes in. They're going to stop throwing the ball to the tight end? Right. Evans, exactly. Evans was a stud on a per down basis last year. Nobody's given the respect he deserves. I'm upset that I'm talking about this right now live. Clint Carlson, the other guys in the league, are going to see because I got him in the, I want to say, late teens, 19th, 20th round in the last champions draft. All right. 7% of his snaps out wide, 48% in the slot. All right. 2.2 yards per route. I believe that is the fourth best yards per route average of, you know, all tight ends uh, returning this season. If not, I think even higher than that. And we're talking about rarefied air of guys that are, uh, you know, in that area. Obviously, it's Bowers, Eric All, Fannin Jr., respect Harold Fannin. He hasn't been going. He's, you know, typically the third tight end off the board, 2.6 yards per route. Colston Loveland and then Mitchell Evans. So he's literally third in terms of returning tight ends in that, that vital metric. It's just a matter of being out there more. He got hurt, which allowed Holden Stays to come in. But even still, you know, Evans got, in eight games, 40 targets, caught 29 for 422 yards and a touchdown. Now, uh, with tight ends, if you – I'll send out my tight end article from last year. The benchmarks I'm looking for are 40, 404, the, the magic four lines. So can, he, can you get 40 receptions, 400 yards, and four touchdowns? And if you can't, can you make up for it in one of those other areas? Can you get 50 receptions? I think with Evans, if you just, I mean, we always, the trend line through eight games, if we're giving him 13, you know, which is what most of the other guys that are in his class are being, you know, measured on, he's going to be at that 60 target mark, you know, and that's, that's a magic number because only 10 guys, excuse me, 11 guys last season got 60 targets as a tight end. So with that, I can't, I can't possibly understand why you do that to my man, Mitchell Evans. Plus, Broke 10 tackles on 29 receptions. Okay. Oh, yeah, that happens all the time. Yeah, guys with 35% broken tackle rates as tight ends. Okay. 14 and a half yards per catch. Come on. Come on. Stop the insanity. I'm not. And none hey, of the this... Champions League are allowed to take them. That's mine. <laughs> yeah. Incredible case that you just made for Mitchell Evans. Uh, hopefully nobody's watching this. Actually, we have like 240 people watching this, so. Oh, you know, oh. Cat, cat, Cat's Mitchell out of the bag Evans at this point. Everyone. Here we go. <laughs> he stinks. <laughs> Don't draft him. <laughs> nah, this Absolutely. is great. This is, this is great why value. we're here. Uh, so, yeah. We, you have any uh, comments on any of these guys, Zach? Any guys that are fallen or the risers? Uh, not a lot here. I mean, the Georgia guys don't, don't surprise me much that, that we're seeing those guys both drop a little bit. Brand yeah. Keithy, I think that's an interesting one, um, where he's, he's coming back from injury. So I know he's a guy that projects really high for us, but it's really going to come down to, um, how, how is he going to come back from that? I like, um, you know, that they have cam rising. It sounds like he's back. So I think that's only going to help him this year. He's a guy that, that I kind of like with where you're getting him value wise, where you can kind of wait just a little bit to get him. And in some drafts, some drafts he's going a little bit higher, but he was one that, that I guess surprised me a little bit that he's falling here. Um, but yeah, not outside of that. I, you know, I think Froton Froton nailed it with, with what he, he brought tonight. So. Dude, I, I, I yeah. will say just getting on to the, the rest of them, since I, I only really addressed one. It's obvious with Delp and Eurosec, they're just cannibalizing each other. I will say with Eurosec, I'm slightly bullish on the fact that I don't think he can go down going to Georgia because if you look at the way that uh, tight ends were used at Stanford by Troy Taylor last year, Eurosec was, and, and Sam Rausch both. So Eurosec was there, he gets hurt, Sam Rausch takes over, and he is now the, the start over there. Uh, they were blocking on 40% of their pass reps. I mean, that's astronomical. And they were already kind of, you know, splitting. Roush was already getting a decent amount of time uh, and cutting in before your set came in. So, I mean, just when you're coming from a, a scheme that's running blocking 40% of the time, then you're going to Georgia, which is one more prolific tight end schemes in the country. I mean, even, you know, for his part, Dell, um, it was very productive on a per target basis. He got 30 targets, caught 24, uh, is, I want to say, second 
among returning tight ends, if not third in reception percentage. So uh, you can't argue with what he did on a printout basis. It's just a matter of how they'll be distributed. And even if you're just taking and having what you got out of Bowers and Delp, because, you know, Bowers is still up there in the 800, you know, yard mark, you know, some, somewhere in that, excuse me, uh, 717. They combined for a thousand yards. If you're having that, that's still, you know, you're in the 40 reception, 500 yard mark with about four or five tight ends, excuse me, touchdowns. You're still in a productive range. Um, I will say with Keithy, really surprised to see that he's at 15, 12 here um, in the more public market. Where we're at in the in the Champions League, which we are in our third league, and we're literally drafting as we speak. I want to say we're in the ninth, uh, ninth round, eighth round right now, and Josh is on the clock, as as it would would happen. So, oh boy, um, <laughs> yeah, Josh, it's on you. I just took Jackson Arnold in the in the eighth. So in that, Bainbridge, our sometimes guest, and when he feels like gracing us with his presence, uh, four nine took Brant Keithy. So. That is a full 11 round difference from the 15 12 that we're seeing on on the public stuff that that Jared has uh, gracefully tabulated for us. Uh, so Bainbridge does not agree, and he's I would say probably going in that four to six range in uh, in these sharp drafts. So could be a market efficiency there on Keithy as well as Evans in my opinion. Yeah, that's good. Well, here let me uh, before we transition to wide receivers, I want to ask you guys a question. This is a leading question. Um, oh, no. but what, are, what were our feelings back in the day on Jalen Samuels? Was he a cheat code? Was he, I mean, he was a cheat code, but was he a legal tight end? Like, you know, Eric, I know you got opinions on who counts. Does, does Jalen Samuels, does he count as a tight end? Jalen Samuels absolutely count as a tight end. Huge, huge difference between the Tito's of the 2024 generation and the Tito's of yore. You see with Jalen Samuels, he lined up at tight end most of the time. He was kind of an H-back, you know, so, like, he'd move around the far formation. But, like, he's lining up in a pass, block, um, receiving. At least he's out there taking passes. He's moving around the formation. He would switch in short yardage situations to be that battering ram, you know, on the goal line or in very short yardage. But then he flexed right out, you know, to be in a tight end. So I feel like he had more of a case to be in that H-back style tight end where, you know, you're still lining up sort of in line, but you're you're offset. He did a lot more of that than just being a straight-up wide receiver like Holden Willis <laughs> and Aronde Gadsden and Dalvin Smith are. They're, they're straight-up wideouts. At least, right. you know, you're getting backfield. You're, you're, you're getting all different types of formations and, and lineups out of Jalen Samuels. I can't. I don't have the numbers offhand, but, you know, we can, we can table that. Yeah. Well, so so I have a high risk, high reward, probably a future Jalen Samuels for us today. I got Elijah Lofton from Miami. I don't know if you guys have been seeing the reports coming out of camp there, but this guy right now is actually the starting running back at Miami. He's going to come in the spring game and he's going to be taking all the running back reps, but he's not like a CJ Donaldson, right? He's not going to play there forever. They're actually going to be going after a, uh, a running back in the portal. If Mark Fletcher is not healthy, if Mark Fletcher is healthy, he's going to get the carries. But Lofton is going to get carries in this offense. And they're already saying he's a top 15 player at the University of Miami, which may or may not be saying much because it's the University of Miami. But Lofton's a guy that is going to get carries out of the backfield. He's going to be featured in this offense, even as a true freshman. Uh, and he basically only gets drafted by me at this point, um, which might be an indication that you should not draft him. I'm the only guy going after him, but, but Elijah Lofton is a name that I think that people should know because he's either going to score like 1.5 fantasy points per game and you can make fun of me on Twitter. So that's a reason to know him, or there is a possibility that he may be the next Jalen Samuel. So just watch out for that guy. He's a guy for you to draft in dynasties. I'll be drafting him in CFF best ball leagues and you can either laugh at me or you can potentially go after him. Anybody else? I don't know if you guys have heard anything about Elijah Lofton. Have you ever heard the name before? Do you guys have, have <laughs> any comments about Elijah Lofton? <laughs> well, Zach Hall gets a... I hear about Elijah Lofton about five times a day from Josh, <laughs> text from Josh, where I feel like he's just 
wanting me to bump up that projection by quite a bit because I just keep getting text after text on him. So yeah, I've heard of him. It sounds like <laughs> sounds like that could be a a good name to know though heading into the the draft season. Here. Uh, yeah, he's either a good name to know or well, I'll have a good kick out of me putting him as my yeah. tight end third. He's my tight end, probably my tight end twenty three or something at this point, but. I make sure to draft him every, every draft. But remember that name, future Jalen Samuels, Elijah Lofton. There we go. You heard it here first. I, I'm a man of the people. I promised this on Twitter, so here we are. We will transition now to the topic of the hour, which is top 10 CFF wide receivers. And so I got a graphic for us to put, put up here. I'm going to uh, share my screen. And uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, we're talking about top 10 wide receivers and, um, and I am butchering this sharing the screen here, oh, I love it. <laughs> but top 10 wide receivers, you know, we, uh, we're not very unique in some of our wide receivers, at least at the top three here, we have Tetro McMillan, we have Luther Burden, and we have Tory Horton, right? And, you know, any way that you go with that, like we had some different different orders here, but these are pretty much the consensus top three that are going in drafts right now. And because all of us are long-winded, we literally spent the first 15 minutes talking about tight ends. We are going to skip those first three because I'm sure that many of you guys have a ton of information on them. Tetron McMillan is playing. I don't know if you know this, but he's playing with his high school quarterback at Arizona. So he gets a lot of targets. Luther Burden is a beast. So he gets a lot of targets. And Torrey Horton is absolute target monster at Colorado state. So there we go. That is all we're going to talk about with those three, but the rest of these seven, we're going to deep dive into a little bit more. And so each of us have uh, taken a little bit, uh, taken one of the, or two of these guys, and we're going to break them down here. We're going to talk about a few different things with these guys, right? Their player profile, the play caller um, that they're going to be with. And then uh, we're also going to talk about their team situation and then talk about them a little bit, have a discussion question for each one. So the first one that we have up here is going to be Evan Stewart. And so Evan Stewart uh, is a guy that several of us know, whether you're a Debbie, C2C, CFF, you know who uh, Evan Stewart is. Right now, for many people, he is their Debbie uh, wide receiver one. Um, and and I, I respect that for sure. He's a guy that has is uber talented. Uh, but his first couple of years uh, at Texas A&M, the first year he came on at the end of the year, the second year, man, he started he started out out of the gate on fire, right? I think the guy had like 23 catches for like, I don't know, 19 catches, 257 yards, like two touchdowns for, over the first two games. And then over like the last eight that he played, he literally had 19 catches for 257 yards and two touchdowns. So same production, but a lot more games. Um, and really the correlation there is that the first couple games, he actually played with Connor Wegman, who's a guy that he had a lot of chemistry with to end his freshman year. Um, and then they had a few different QBs that played play there at Texas a and He has now transferred over to Oregon, right? They scooped him up in the transfer, transfer portal after some like weird deals with Tennessee and Ole Miss backing off. Um, and But he ends up landing at Oregon. Lands in a really good opportunity. He has Will Stein as his OC. Will Stein has been an OC for two total years, one at Oregon and one at UTSA. But those two years have been monsters for his wide receiver ones. Both have been outside wide receivers. Zakari Franklin there at UTSA. And then he had, who we all know, um, Troy Franklin this last year, who just had an absolute monster year. Uh, but yeah, they averaged 22.3 fantasy points per game, 124 targets, 88 receptions, 1,260 yards, and 14 and a half touchdowns. Um, if we just counted Will Stein's two years as a play caller, he would be the highest uh, or the best play caller for wide receiver ones in our database at 22.3 fantasy points per game. Um, so he's been unbelievable um, as a play caller um, so far in his two years for wide receiver ones. Team situation, got a new QB, but it's a guy that's been around forever in Dylan Gabriel um, there at Oregon. But everybody else returns um, except Troy Franklin, which he's stepping in, into that role. Um, and that's including Tez Johnson. And so our projections have Evan Stewart um, at 110 targets, 
80 receptions. We have him at 1,056 yards and nine touchdowns for 20.9 fantasy points per game. He is our wide receiver four in our projections. But we have a 56% confidence rating on Evan Stewart, where every other player in our top 10, we really have in the 80% range almost. And so, uh, Zach, I'm going to let you explain a little bit what is our confidence rating? And then, Froton, I got a question for you right after that. Yeah. So just real quickly, um, we just developed this confidence rating as we're going through projections for guys where they're maybe a little bit more risky or, um, you know, maybe just lesser knowns about them. And so when you look at that confidence ranking for, for any of these positions we have, it's taking into account player history, how well they've done, you know, not just last season, but prior seasons as well. Um, looking at play caller or system history, how, how well they use um, that certain position in their system. Um, we're looking at experience in the system, which is a knock on Evan Stewart here, just because he's new. So that transfer um, will kind of take him down a little bit. We look at injury concerns, um, had back injury. We're looking at, um, this is a big one too, right? If a guy like um, Colin Lacey was one guy where you'll see his, uh, his confidence low as well, just because we aren't sure yet where they, where they're going to be. Are they going to be that wide receiver one? So we factor that in a little bit um, transfers. So if they're transferring up or down, right, a level um, that's taken into account. So there's a whole bunch of things that we're just taking a look at putting together and then saying, all right, here's, here's where we feel like if this is the wide receiver one in the system and does what he's capable of, this is what the projection is. But based on all these other factors where, Evan Stewart just doesn't have a ton of production over the course of a season outside of a few games, and he's in a new system. So that that kind of knocks him down, whereas you'll see a guy like Torrey Horton, who he's at a confidence of 95 just because we've seen him do it in that system, right? So and a lot of a lot of familiarity there. So that's that's the, the a little bit behind the confidence that you'll see on the the rankings that we have. Yeah, that's really good. So Froton, what do you, what do you think? Are we you know, what do you think the chances are that that Evan Stewart is a bust this year? Is it really kind of 50-50 like we've kind of proposed it in our confidence rating? Or do you see it as, nah, he's more of a, he's going to hit this year? Well, I mean, I think you could take a look at what Troy Franklin did last year. How was he's filling that role as Willie, primetime Willie Stein's ex, 81 catches, 114 targets, 1383 yards, uh, 17 yards per catch, 14 touchdowns in 13 games. That is, in terms of yardage accrued, sixth amongst all wideouts. Uh, it's also sixth in yards per route, 3.2 yards per route. The question is, do you think uh, Evan Stewart is up to Troy Franklin skills-wise? I think he's better, frankly. Uh, in terms of my 2025 from a Devi perspective, I think you could credibly say he's number two. I have Ted Aroa as my one. Uh, I need to see a little bit more downfield stuff from Luther Burton. He's great with the extended handoffs and, you know, within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage, but I want to see it downfield. I still think that's very much open between the two. Uh, so, I mean, when you're talking about a guy who's a top three NFL talent, he's going into a primetime system. It's plug and play. I mean, it's all there. I feel really good. I feel like that maybe that's a little conservative on the 50% side. You know, I might put it like 65, you know, call it two thirds. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You, you know, I picked them in this last draft that they were in the champion series that we're all doing together um, after you guys both passed on them. So uh, I took them in the last what, draft. So what, what of us, know, what of us has confidence in them? <laughs> No, nah, that's good. Yeah, I got I got Tetsuro McMillan, our wide receiver one here, and then I got came around and got Evan Stewart. So I was very happy Woo. with that haul. I mean, look, like Tetsuro, I, I or Tetsuro, I can, Evan Stewart, I can't imagine that he doesn't hit just because I really trust Will Stein. Um, but I think these are things, I think everything that we baked into the confidence rating is something that you should be considering. And Evan Stewart, he's coming probably into a more secure system, but there's lots of guys that, just because you see projections out there, you need to understand that some of those projections do come with some risk to them. And so just wanted to point that out uh, as we talked about it. 
And then uh, instead of talking about another Oregon player later, we're going to skip real quick to Tez Johnson. He's a wide receiver eight here, but he's another guy that's in the system. And look, Tez Johnson is was phenomenal last year. Broke out with his brother, Bo Nix. Um, and Will Stein, as good as he's been with wide receiver ones, he's been crazy good with wide receiver twos as well. Uh, Tess Johnson had 18.9 fantasy points per game and last year. And the year before that, Joshua Cephas had 17.2. So in his two years, um, man, his wide receivers are average, averaging 1,000 yards, 87 catches, and eight touchdowns, 18 fantasy points per game. That's right around right what Tess scored last year. We have a 88% confidence score because he's been in the system for an extra year. So my question for you guys, um, and either one of you guys can go first on this, but for a time, maybe you should go first since since uh, Zach went first last time. Would you rather have Evan Stewart at the end of round one, which is what his ADP is, or Tess Johnson at the end of round two? Uh, I, that's a I'm really good from, question. Ugh, I'll start. No, no, go for it, Zach. I was just going to say it, that's tough because I've taken – I like Evan Stewart when you – I really liked him when you were getting him towards the end of round two. Um, he's starting to creep up a little bit now, which um, I still don't mind him. Like, I still love the value that, that you can get. Like, I think Evan Stewart's going to have a, a great year. But now, just kind of where Evan Stewart's going now and how some of these drafts have fallen, I I kind of like Tez Johnson more, um, getting him kind of at that back end of two. If you can get him in round three, then – um, I love being able to do that just because, again, he did it last year. He's been in this system. I just feel like that's – he's a guy that – he's kind of a sure thing there, it feels like. Um, so that, that's kind of how I've, I have I viewed this. Evan Stewart, I loved him when you got him in the middle of the second round or even the end. And now that he's kind of creeping up a little bit, um, I'm starting to like Tez Johnson. Yeah, that's really good. Hey, for time before you answer, hey, in the comments, if you guys want to tell us who you guys got, Tez or Evan, love to hear that too. Go ahead, Froton. Yeah, and speaking of the comments, props to Steven Johnson. He's wearing his Play College Fantasy Football shirt right now, supporting the cause. Uh, I will say this, man, it's it's a nice problem to have, choosing between Tez Johnson and uh, and Evan Stewart, because two uh, of the top six yards per route leaders nationwide in the entire FBS, two of them went to Oregon of the top six, Tez Johnson and Troy Franklin. So again, this is such an explosive system. Now they're going to the big 10. I know there's probably somebody out there saying, but they're going to the big 10. They're going to the big 10 for Oton. And you're right. And you're right. <laughs> um, I am going to say, I would prefer Evan Stewart in the, uh, you know, early second, which is where I kind of see him going as opposed to Tez Johnson, in the late second. And the reason why is simply, you know, it's the outside exposition and he's just simply a better overall receiver. I want the high end of what I think Evan Stewart could be, whereas Tez Johnson is more of an extended handoff guy, you know, 7.6 ADOT, all right? Um, now, he was a top 10 in Yak, eight and a half yards after catch, you know, which is obviously a big deal, but only four contested targets all season long. He got two contested targets. That's, that's almost, I mean, it's unbelievable. I see him in the same vein that I see Brennan Presley, which is he is a volume dependent guy, you know, in a big time offense that is having some, you know, change over the QB position from Bo Nix to Dylan Gabriel. It's a little bit different. Tez Johnson obviously was the, uh, is the stepbrother uh, of Bo Nix, you know, so it doesn't get much tighter than that. And when you're a slot receiver, you know, you're kind of dependent on that rhythm. I just think there are more ways for Evan Stewart to be a outsized, you know, super profitable wide receiver uh, who makes a, you know, an every week impact than Tez Johnson as a slot receiver who's going to be more volume dependent and, uh, you know, he needs to get the ball in space. So I just think I'm going to go with the overall talent there, though I've drafted both of them. Yes, I love that, man. I, I love this comment from Chris Moxley coming with the random facts. Tez can deadlift 500 pounds at 150 pounds. Man is a menace. I love it. Look, I'm picking him for that reason. Alone. I'm 150 pounds myself, so here we are. Uh, Chris also, Moxley is a, is a menace out there on the bird trails of South Carolina. Okay. Yes. We've all seen the, the photos on Twitter. You <laughs> be careful. 
do not get in that swarthy man's way. Okay. Dude, if he is trying to get a shot of a particular bird when he's out there birding. Yes. Shout out to us too, man. Like we, we can get Kevin Concepcion's name spelled correctly on here, but Tess Johnson. Nope. No, sir. We cannot get that one right. No, we can't get Tess. No, <laughs> no, we got to keep, keep, keep everybody on their toes. So uh, real quick, we had a comment here before we go on to Jalen Royals, but uh, why the F is no one drafting Matthew oh, Goldman wow. all of a sudden? Did he switch Car- to Gable Tennis or something? Carp Golf is coming hot at us right now. He's yes. coming at us. And it's true. Did, was he a DNP? Was he a UDFA in our last one? I think he got – Gold got think he went like late. mid-20s. Yeah, I, I will say, say. – After I yeah. took him in like the 15th round, I want to say, or something in the first one. And yeah. then quickly was like, oh, okay, I'm out of step with this. I, I, second team, okay, well, let's let's back off that. But That's um, right. Yeah, he is he is being disrespected. The problem is, and I had this conversation today with with my good friend, the CFF coordinator, Joe Capozzi, uh, Bill Ricca's finest and uh, a great defensive coordinator in his own right, mm-hmm. uh, where we were talking about Matthew Golden. And it's like, is he is he going to be the next Jordan Whittington? That mid Carter that just that just milk toast uninspiring slot receiver in that offense who just does enough, churns out enough routes to be on the props list every week. And for me to be able to fade every single week, profit from, like I could from Jordan Whittington, legitimate all Big 12 props performer. He was great. I missed Jordan. I'm going to miss this, Jordan Whittington. This is gold, right? This is a great point. I love I'm about to say this is golden, but uh, that made would be a lot too, of money uh, off Jordan Whittington. <laughs> you know that with Jacko. Jacko's out there. He knows. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's running a second team. That's basically it. DeAndre Moore's running the slot, cooking uh, Bond are outside right now. So if he makes a move, we'll start drafting him again. Uh, Shane, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, Shane likes turn. Sam Brown better. If he was still at Houston, Matthew Golden, I would also. Probably like Sam Brown better at this point. So Sam Brown went pretty late in the last experts draft as well. You know, to be completely honest, both of them yes. falling out of favor. I, I I wonder that what that kind of accounts for. Because remember, just sitting there being like, Sam Brown's still out there. All right, all right, I still got yeah. Sam Brown to lean on, and, yes. and then he ended up going. I'll uh, well, I'll control F. It's, it's stump for me here. There we Sam go. Brown. Well, we we got we got twenty eight minutes if we're gonna keep to our word of letting people all watch right. the second half of this deal. So I'm going to let you take Jalen Royals here and run with him. He is our wide receiver five for Oton. Okay. Not until I find Sam Brown. I can't find him. I can't find him. <laughs> All right. No problem. Moving on. <laughs> it's my OCD. I can't help it. It's why I'm a good writer. It's because I get locked in. I'm like, I have to find Sam Brown's ADP. I love it. Got to find guys. his route numbers. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a geek. All right. Well, hey, Jalen Royals. Blake Anderson, everybody's favorite, right, out there from Arizona State. Made a legend out of our boy Omar Blaylock. Was that was that Omar Blaylock? Is that exactly his name? Right? Seventh yes. rounder. Somehow that guy squeezed into an NFL draft position, I think. He was actually <laughs> taken at the end. Um, you know, we had, obviously, the Corey Rucker explosion, the revival, who now would have an act two of Corey Rucker over there at Arkansas State, who isn't excited <laughs> about that. Yeah. But, uh, now he's over there in Utah State, and he has had a chance to kind of turn this roster over and, and remold it in his image. And in doing so, we know what Blake Anderson wants to do, and he wants to throw the ball. Not the super prolific um, on a per-game basis last season, 33 and a half passes per game. Not bad. You know, we'll take it. It's in that, that 40 range. Uh, 254 passing yards per game. It's 44th. but productive uh they cashed in 35 passing touchdowns that's actually the eighth most as a team in the fbs last year doesn't sound like much does it you know but that's that's as a team so between cooper lagasse and company that's what they were to produce uh 33 points per game 26th in the country so once again you know where blake anderson goes points follow and so does you know pretty good passing game that 253 yards per game is a little down from his, you know, what we've seen from him on a yearly basis. I mean, gosh, you remember some of those um, those old school justice days, you know, our boy justice. 
he was reining up. They they had the uh, Bonner. They had the the two man weave uh, at quarterback. Like they were putting up forty touchdowns a game. They were putting up well over three hundred. So that was a real boon to be there. Fortunately for Royals, no more Tyler Vaughn. He, obviously, he was a different position. He lines up wide ninety one percent of the times where Vaughn was the slot. But hey, look. There goes 20%, 120, uh, 26% of the target share, 120 targets are gone. For his part, lead outside X, Jalen Royals, 21% target share. So I think we could realistically see that bump. You know, he could maybe even get into that golden 30% mark. I mean, if he does, if he's in that, if he's getting 130, 140 targets, like, I mean, he could take the top off of this projection. As for last year, 70 of 99 just missed the century mark, 71% reception rate on a 13-yard dot. Not bad. Uh, one of a rare club, which is the 70-13 club, which I will write about later. You guys, I'll, I'll kind of tease you on that. Um, but that being said, uh, really catching it at 15 touchdowns. Again, you know, when you're putting up 35 passing touchdowns, that's what's going to happen. And that really kind of separates him uh, from a lot of his peers and why he is a top 10 receiver is that potential and their proclivity for passing the ball. As far as his overall grade, 79, 79th percentile overall, 80th percentile receiving grade from PFF, uh, as stated, 2.2 yards per route, 53rd out of 121 qualifying receivers with 70 plus targets. So, you know, this isn't a elite Wide receiver on his own. He is kind of more of a, a system product. 13 ADOT is mentioned. Six yards after catch, that's 56. Uh, where he is particularly good. I mean, he catches, contested catches, 17 to 23. 74th, 74% contested catch rate, that's fourth best nationally. Pretty damn good. 23% missed tackle rate, that's 28th nationally. Dodge 16th tackles and a 142 passer rating when targeted. That's excellent. I mean, 158 is perfect. So um, what I really do like about his profile to tie it up, 29% downfield target rate. Okay, so Vaughn's, Tyler Vaughn's wasn't getting that. That's what uh, Royals was down there doing. I did watch a couple of his games in preparation for this. And a couple of, I mean, what you're going to get from that scheme where there's so many receivers running routes is sometimes you get forgotten. And against Colorado State, he had three touchdowns, and two of them were just bare-naked jailbreaks. Not getting anything particularly amazing. He did adjust well to, to one of the catches, um, you know, in order to make it. But, I mean, he had five yards of separation before he had to separate and come back and then take it. So, I mean, I see athleticism. It's good. You know, he has athleticism. He has skill. Um, he will get, you know, 50% of – excuse me, 45% of his targets were downfield. 55% were you know, within nine yards of the line of scrimmage. He does have the ability to take it to the house or get downfield. So um, I feel pretty good about Royals' projection. Is he an NFL caliber guy? You know, probably not. But in CFF, system matters. And he is in a place that you want to be. And he's the lead dog there. So give me the lead X wide receiver for Blake Anderson, Jalen Royals. Yeah. I love that. And, you know, I think one of the things you mentioned, right, with the vacated uh, production from Terrell Vons, one of the things that one that uh, Zach and I have been looking into is it's always a slot and outside wide receiver that a wide receiver one and wide receiver two in that system. And right now, the guy that uh, Jared, Jared Palmgrim and I, we went, I went on a show and I was we were raving about Robert Freeman, the fourth string slot receiver that's come in there. <laughs> at utah state but that's the guy like that's the most dynamic guy in the slot at this point in my opinion um and he's fourth or fifth string right now in the depth chart and so it really is like jalen royals and everybody else um so i think that's a really good point zach you have anything on jalen uh just real quick you know first time already kind of brought it up but just that target share it feels like there's room for to grow there right where we've seen some of these wide receiver ones in this system um, especially on the outside, get 28 to 30 percent of that target share. So um, definitely uh, some some upside on that piece. The one thing that really sticks out to me, though, is the the 15 touchdowns, um, which I'm I'm wondering if if he'll be able to repeat that this year. Um, we don't see that a ton in this system. Um, 15 
pretty much on the high end. So that that could be a little bit of a hit to his value, maybe this this, this upcoming season. But uh, again, still feels like all the production is going to be there um, for him. Yeah, and, and keep in mind with Blaylock, he got like 162 targets one year. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like yeah. that's that's yeah. sixty three more targets than what Royals yeah. got. So, yeah, I mean, will right. there be a regression in the mean? I, I think certainly. I think you can make that up in in terms of just volume, you know, because yeah. yeah. there's certainly room. You only had a thousand eighty four receiving yards there. Yeah, and one yeah. of those one of those quarterbacks is going to hit for sure. So, Zach, yeah, you want to take us on? Yeah, you want to take us on to our next wide receiver? Yeah, Ricky White, wide receiver at UNLV. So last year, I have him at 189 receptions over yards and eight touchdowns. He averaged around 20 points per game, which put him at wide receiver. So really good year from him. He had six top 15 performances last year. Seven times he went over 100 yards, which is always good to see. I like to look at um, how many times they're targeted each week. Six times he had 10 plus targets. Um, two additional times he had nine. So eight times he had at least nine plus targets, um, which is what, you, what you're going to want in CFF. Um, the other interesting thing, he only had eight touchdowns on the season, but he didn't have a receiving touchdown until week seven. So he did um, all of that in the back half of the year. And uh, he really, really, the difference was when Jaden Maeva took over that, that quarterback spot. And I think they had that they had a pretty good connection there. Um, he's currently um, going as the fifth receiver off the board, mid second round guy. Um, ADP, we have him at 11.6. We have him projected at 15.6 points per game, which is um, down from where he was last year. Looking at uh, Brendan Mary and his, his play caller, we have limited um, play calling data for him, but he did have a thousand yard receiver when he was OC at Howard um, in. As a passing game coordinator at Texas, that's where Worthy had 111 targets um, there and 760 yards, nine touchdowns. He also had uh, 2021, he was at Pitt with Jordan Addison as a wide receiver coach. So you saw 145 targets for 100 receptions and 1,500, almost 1,600 yards there. So um, I like what where Marion comes from and what he did last year. Um, he has... A new quarterback, though, this year, which I we talked about it, I believe, last week with uh, Sluka and then Haj Malik Williams, right? Who's going to be that guy? Both of those guys coming from FCS. So um, what what kind of quarterback are we going to get? Are we going to get a guy that can get him the ball? That's kind of one thing that, that um, I guess jumps out to me a little bit. But they do have four starters back on the offensive line. Um, they have some returning running backs um, as well. But I feel like he's definitely the centerpiece of this offense, right? Um, as long as they get a quarter, find a quarterback that can get him the ball. Um, he's, he's going to be able to put up close to, close to that same, those same numbers um, that we saw last <laughs> and really took off with um, when Jaden Maeva took over. So um, if they can get a competent quarterback in there, I think he's got He's got a chance to, to have another really good season, but again, I don't know if you guys have thoughts on just that, that quarterback. What kind of quarterback are we going to get in this system? And are they going to run a similar system? We don't really have a ton of history on um, with Brendan Murray. And I think we have ideas of what, he, what he's going to do, but there's just not a lot of actually seeing him do it um, at this level. Yeah, I mean, I talked to a guy that's pretty plugged in there, you know, be quite a bit about what their system's going to look like this year. And he was saying, and you can see this right. And the guys that they've got Hodge Malik Williams and Matthew Sluka battling out this year that they're trying to go away from passing it so much. They felt like maybe I shouldn't be saying all this on air. <laughs> there are reasons why they had to pass as much as they did and they don't want to pass that much. I think they want to be more like the go-go offense, two running backs on the same side, more creative in that way. I don't. I think the emphasis that they had on Ricky White, they might want to distribute that a little bit more. Um, so I was told, man, like maybe he shouldn't be going as high as he is, but it's hard to ignore <laughs> that production that he had over the last six weeks of the year. I mean, he was just flat out incredible. I don't know what you do with that. I mean, sometimes the guy is just so talented that uh, even he can overcome, you know, what coaches want to do. So what do you think, Froton? 
I mean, I, I love the thing that's great about White too. Not only was he ultra productive, almost fifteen hundred yards, one hundred and thirty-five targets. You know, I mean, that's just insane. But he started slow. Bryant week one, he had two catches for five yards. Then Michigan week two, two catches for thirty-one, and he proceeded to just absolutely take the top off of every defense in the Mountain West, pretty much. I mean, it was, what a performance! Um, but like you're saying, you know, is that something that's repeatable from year to year? Is that something they want to do is be forced to, you know, be vertical all the time? It got them to the conference championship game where UNLV stunk forever leading up to that. You know, just forever. No big deal. So I don't know. I, I'm sure they want to get away from throwing as much as they did. But, man. He was pretty successful. Kind of works. Yeah, we have some turnover at QB, especially if Sluke is there. You have a dual threat, you know, more of it. But, gosh, it's it, it's tough to to look at these numbers and say, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to draft Ricky White in the top 10, you know, for instance. Right. It's going to be tough to put him out of that top that no. wide receiver one. You know, how do you how do you look at him and say, no, I don't, I don't want him in the third round? Yeah, absolutely. No, you're 100% right. I mean, it's hard to not take the shots on them. So, totally agree. Okay, we're going to move on to Kevin Concepcion. Uh, when we first threw up this graphic, our top 10, uh, Steve had a comment. He said, Casey overrated. And what I would say to you, Steve, is that our other two guys here would absolutely agree with you. I'm the reason why he is as high as he is. I had him ranked the highest. Uh, I think Froton maybe had him at 10, and Zach had him at 8. And so, yeah, you know, but, you know, Casey, Conce you know, Kevin Concepcion, he was unbelievable as a true freshman. Um, he was one of my big calls the first week when they played UConn. I was like, hey, listen, in DFS, this guy's going to smash. And then he had two catches for 34 yards. I looked like an idiot. I just picked, you know, the wrong the wrong week uh, to, to, uh, to like him because every other week he was killing it, right? He had 19 fantasy points per game on the year, right? He had 71 catches for 839 yards and 10 touchdowns. And then he had 41 carries uh, for what, like 300 yards um, on top of that. And so we know Robert and I is his play caller. Um, Robert and I is super creative. He gets the ball in his playmaker's hands. That's what he does. We talked about him pretty ad nauseum on a podcast that Zach and I did uh, when Eric and Mike, who's still missing, were out at the bachelor party. So y'all can go back and listen to that. If you want to know more about Robert and I, but He's a guy that, had, you know, again, he loves to feature his playmakers. But, man, there are a ton of them in this offense right now. They brought in uh, Jordan Waters at running back. They brought in Grayson McCall to come be the QB because they didn't like what they had last year. Um, and then they brought in Noah Rogers, a former five-star. And then they also brought in Wesley Grimes, who was pretty highly rated on on three um, in their rating system. And so a guy in that a guy that's produced a little bit at Wake Forest. And so there's, you know, there's a bunch of talent now here at North Carolina State. So my question for you guys, like, can we can we trust Kevin Concepcion to produce what he did last year with all of this influx of talent at the wide receiver and the running back position? I would say, I mean, you got to remember with him, a lot of his value is derived from carries. You know, he, he was getting yep. – he didn't get a single carry in e any of the first five games last year. Zero. Yep. He gets one in, in week six for six yards, and then he proceeds to go – they just decide that, all right, Jordan Houston, uh, while we're going to keep considering him the starter so that we can have a props line on him every week and we can take us under every week, you know, which we appreciate. I mean, Concepcion was the one who was driving the bus, you know, for that entire offense for the last eight games of the season. It's all there and you can look at it and it's all in black and white. I mean, they were desperate, like you said. Uh, they have restocked the cupboard, you know, in, in theory, like you said, bringing in transfer portal additions and what have you. So they shouldn't have to lean on this heavy slot usage, uh, you know, moving them all over the place like he's a, a souped-up Devo Samuel. I mean, he was getting 
six, seven carries a game he was averaging over the, the second half. So, I mean, that's just wild usage. Um, we'll see how it goes for the season. I think he is more of a high-end number two, you know, a, a good solid number two receiver as opposed to a one, which is where we are here. But, you know, um, I put him at 10 and, and I'm going to stick with it. Yeah, no problem with that. What do you think, Zach? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess my concern here is they they obviously brought in um, some other guys in that offense to surround him with. Um, Froton brings up a really good point about those rushing attempts. He didn't see over nine targets in the last handful of games when he started to run the ball more. Um, he he did see more targets earlier in the year, but he, you know, I if. I, I just don't see – I feel like this is one where he, he's going to be one of those guys where we look back and we're like, yeah, we he, too, we overvalued him too early in the draft season. Um, not that he's not going – I think he's going to have some good games. I think he's a good best ball option for sure. Um, but it's just really hard to see if, if they don't use him the same way they did last year, which I don't know if they will. I It's going to be a hard – to get the production he needs to be, um, you know, a top, a top receiver. So it'll be interesting to see how they use him. I'm really excited to see this offense and, and what they do. I like them bringing in. Um, I think he's going to do really well in this offense, which is only going to help him um, in the passing game, I think. Um, but it'll just be, I'm interested to see how, how they're going to use him. If they use him the same they did last year, or if he's just going to be out of the slot and, um, look more like the the first part of the year where the production was just a little bit down. Yeah, it does feel like maybe seven or eight uh, is his ceiling. Um, so, and, you know, to be fair, we haven't projected at 14 in our projections, and yet we put them, you know, me and Zach both put them at seven, eight. Yeah. So um, there's, an element of, there's an element of, of safety with wide receivers that there is a premium to that I don't feel like. That's true. It's a more plug and play sort of thing with running backs where you know, okay, Jordan James is the running back. You know, he's atop the depth chart in Oregon. I know what that's going to look like. So, yeah, that's, how that kind of that, yeah. that's a really good point. Froton, why don't you take us on to our number nine wide receiver? We talked about Tez Johnson earlier, who's our eight. And so now we're at nine with Sean Atkins, the former walk on at USF. Yeah, Sean Atkins, the diet. Uh, of course. I mean, USF, such a trendy team that I'm sure everybody in the college fantasy football community has endeared themselves to, at least in, when it comes to Byron Brown. Uh, when it comes to Atkins, though, 5'10", 172, so he's light, and, and that's what he's billed at. You know how that can be. 60-year guy, all right? So late bloomer, took some time to get there, uh, but, you know, when – He's there in the USF offense, 34 and a half passes per game, 270 passing yards per game. Pretty good. Again, this is year one of Byron Brown. I think it's reasonable to expect a little, uh, you know, bump from that. 27 touchdown passes, 34, 94 yards passing. And again, this is Alex Golish, the lieutenant of Josh Heupel over there at Tennessee. And he pretty much turned around this program after Jeff Scott, Pissed all over it. 32 points per game. Uh, that's 33rd in the country. Seventh in returning targets. Sean Atkins, 118 targets last year. 26% target share. That was tops in on the team. Uh, you'd like to see a little more in terms of the touchdown production. Only seven touchdowns. But caught 94 of those 120 targets. Uh, a 78% catch rate. 1,069 yards, 11.4 yards per catch. Again, the same profile that we kind of see with Concepcion without the, the carries. And as we mentioned, Tez Johnson, he, he's got that that sort of a, a slot profile, 91% slot rate, uh, 78th percentile overall grade, 78th percentile receiving grade, dodged 21 tackles, pretty damn good, 23% missed tackle rate. Uh, caught 11 of 16 contested targets. Excellent. 69%. That's right in that top 10 uh, countrywide. 2.3 yards per route. We'll accept it. You know, again, it's not great. 
7.8 a dot you know right around that seven eight yards uh target depth the classic slot profile 5.5 yards after catch isn't quite dynamic like we see from Tez Johnson, you know, who's up there in that eight and a half, nine yards per catch. Uh, you want to have, especially as a slot receiver, I want to see him over six at least. I want to, you know, I want to see him over seven uh, if possible, but here we are. 5% drop rate, excellent hands. Um, but just the volume with him. You know, he gained trust as the season went on. Double-digit targets in six out of his last eight games. I mean, that's a recipe for magic. Uh, but again, only a 10% downfield target rate. He's a, he's a straight slot. You know, it's it's the opposite of what we saw with, with Jalen Royals, who was stretching the field. And yeah, because of it, you're seeing those touchdowns. Jalen Royals, 12 deep touchdowns. Sean Atkins, just two. So, you know, it just the, – the dichotomy between the two players, they're going in a similar range. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times you're, you're picking between Royals or Atkins. Important to understand these profiles and why you're picking them there. You're not going to get it out of only 12 downfield targets out of Atkins. A lot more volume-based here. Um, 48% of his targets were between uh, 0 to 9 yards. So, again, those manufactured touches, short. 22% of his targets were behind the line of scrimmage. All right? So that's a full 70% of his targets are coming at the line of scrimmage or within 9 yards of it. So you have to be able to break tackles, and I'd like to see more than five and a half yards after contact with that profile. Yeah. 90th percentile PFF grade to all four levels, though. So he does win when he does go downfield, caught half of those 12 downfield targets. Sean Atkins. Yep. And I think the Jalen Royals point is a really good point because I think you need to know what your league scoring is, and that can really determine, right? If you're going half-point PPR – like I'm Sean Atkins for me is not even a top two round pick. I'm waiting third or fourth round because he's just not going to get a ton of touchdowns. Um, whereas a Jalen Royals, right? He's downfield. You want a guy like that in your half PPRs as outside guys where a lot of our top 10 just that are being drafted are slot guys. And so they are built for PPR scoring more than a half PPR, a no PPR league. So I think knowing that is really helpful. Sean Atkins to me is the G5 version of Xavier Shepro. He's not going to be the most athletic guy on the team, but man, like he just, he produces. And I mean, I don't really know what you do with that. Um, yeah. And, and, and so. for perspective on Atkins, last two Champions League drafts, again, these ex expert drafts went 2 7 mm -hmm. uh, in the second draft and just went 2 11 in the one that is currently drafted in the ninth round. Yep. That's good. All right, Zach. Uh, what? Yeah, that's good. Zach, bring us home, man. Our last one. We got Joey Hobe Ober that, uh, I don't even know how you say his name. Ober. I'm guessing because of the saints quarterback back in the day. I'm going to go with Ober. Yeah. We'll, we'll go with it. Right. We'll get Zach, creative. Let's go. Joey. Where are we going? We'll call him Joey. Joey. Hey, bear. Uh, <laughs> receiver, Texas state. So last year, uh, 99 targets, 76 receptions for 895 yards and eight touchdowns. He did that, and I had him in 10 games. I think he actually had 11. I got a double check. Um, average 20 points per game. I am – I have the wrong – I'm reading you guys, uh, Ricky White. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, you're Ricky White. All right, well, good. that's all right. You just have to Give me one second. Give me one second here. <laughs> I was just, gonna, just, just, pages I, I was just so impressed with Ricky White. I just wanted to roll those off again. Give me one second. You let me know when you're um, ready, but my, my man came from Utah. They're impressive Tech. numbers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he came with the passing game coordinator there that came down to Texas State. And so uh, he had 90, sorry, 92 yeah. targets. Uh, yeah. Oh, maybe I did have some of this right. 92 targets, 71 receptions, 847 yards, and eight touchdowns. Um, Sorry, man, this really threw me off. He had six, six top 15 performances, seven times he went over 100 yards last year. Um, six times he had 10 plus targets. So, again, kind of back to what we've been talking about. It's just a volume play here, right? He's getting a ton of targets here. Um, had at least, sorry, in the last seven games, he averaged 100 yards on eight receptions and 11 targets um, and had at least one touchdown those games so really towards the end of the year he really started to turn it on last year 
um, four top 10 finishes um, in the last seven games. So uh, really, really good um, end of the year for him. He did have one game there against Troy where he, uh, he only had three receptions for 51 yards, but that second half of the season, he really turned it on. Um, we He's in the JG Kinney uh, Mac left, which so uh, not a ton of history on these guys either. Um, but we have seen Kinney with uh, wide receiver one average in 17.2 points per game, um, which actually includes his year at Hawaii where um, he only had his wide receiver one in the slot was only at eight points per game that year. So if you just take the last three seasons, is at 20.2 points per game, which ranks really high um, over the last three years. So um, he has Jordan McLeod coming in, which um, I think is, is going to be a pretty good play there at quarterback. Um, in that offense, he they do have Mahdi, which we talked about a little bit last week. How he he should be a top ten running back, but because of Josh, he he fell out of the top ten. Um, four serves back on the O line, so there's a lot to like about this offense. Um, they're going to target this guy. The the only other question I really have is Cole Wilson's back right, and he had 90 targets himself. So. Are we going to see this kind of split a little bit? And that's that's the only thing really that gives me pause here. But he's he's a guy that he really excelled in this offense when they started to get him the ball um, from week four on. And from from that point on, I mean, he was pretty much locked in as a top 20 receiver outside of a few weeks. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, G.J. Kenny, <laughs> the guy has proven to be just a savant when it comes to calling offenses and Jordan McLeod is going to be upgrade over TJ uh, who was there last year. Um, so I, I just think the sky's the limit for this offense. And I think both those guys are going to eat Cole Wilson's great value in like the 10th round. So I think, I think, I think Hober, Ober is safe and uh, I think Cole Wilson's safe too. You got any, any final thoughts before we close this out for a time? Yeah, I do think there's some upside in the offense, you know, through, uh, 33 times per game last year, 271 yards, 24 touchdowns, right? 3,500 yards passing. As stated, you know, in theory, you'd get a bump, even though yep. TJ Finley is a pretty good QB. But in theory, Jordan McLeod did have a clearly better season than he did last year. Jordan McLeod was incredible last season. You would think that would be a bump. But, you know, when it comes down to Hobart, he's he's a slot receiver. You know, again, he's lining up in the slot 92% of the time. Uh, how do you feel about that? It's it's th that classic profile. We've got quite a few of them in this top list, you know. So um, just know what you're getting into. It's going to be volume-based. The touchdown is going to be a little bit variable. Uh, he got, like we said, just absolutely pounded with targets. You love to see the volume, especially a guy who didn't start getting much early in the season, and then those targets ramped up. So like Zach was talking about, like what more do you want from that? I mean, we're looking for trends here and that's giving it to you, but just be, be forewarned, you know, eight and a half yard, eight odd, um, 6.2 yards after catch. That's pretty good. Dodge 15 tackles last year. So he has an athletic profile uh, for, you know, a, a slot receiver, but, Limit your expectations. He's not going to be hitting the home runs. You know, he's yeah. going to be getting a, a lot of targets and cashing them in and having those nice, consistent, uh, you know, 15 point games where he's going to have a nice high floor. And, and that's the appeal. Yeah, I think I think to wrap this up, right, like we have a lot, especially in, this, in the lower half, a lot of slot receivers here. And so, again. Be mindful of your scoring, right? The we a lot of this is, is yeah, based on you, full PPR especially leagues. Especially in PPR. Yeah. Yep. If you don't have PPR scoring, it's going to drastically affect some of these guys' yep. value, though. I mean, volume's volume, and eventually you're going to find the end zone in college if you touch the ball enough. Yep. Totally. Totally. So, hey, we got 630 people in here. We've had a lot of comments in here. And so, look, we are so thankful that you guys would join us, especially on – with the national championship for men's basketball on right now. And so thank you guys for doing that. Hey, if you guys want to support us in any way, you can like subscribe uh, to our channel, right? We're going to be on live every Monday at 8 PM central, 9 PM Eastern time. And so we'd love for you guys to join us. In fact, our next topic is either going to be 
our top 10 QBs or our top 10 tight ends. And I want you guys to let us know what you guys want us to cover next. So you can comment either uh, later on this, or you can hit us up in our DMS on, on Twitter or X and let us know what you want. And we'll, we'll pick QBs or tight ends based on what you guys give us in your feedback. So again, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. We're really, really appreciative of that. And until next time, do small things with great love.